I'm Ray Cappy. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the founding director of SciArc. And it's a great privilege for me to introduce Paul Rudolph to you this evening. Paul Rudolph is an exceptional architect. When I was just beginning, you want it that way? Okay. <laughs> When I was just beginning my studies of architecture at University of California at Berkeley in 1947, uh, Paul had just completed his Master of Architecture degree at Harvard under Walter Rugropius. He had completed his undergraduate degree about seven years earlier, and his work was already being published in that year, 1947, and he was making a tremendous impact upon those of us being educated in those post-World War II years. His work in those early days were, was with uh, Ralph Twitchell in Florida. Paul opened his own office in 1952, and six years later became the chairman of the department at Yale. By this time, from 47 to 58, he had completed about 50 projects, mostly residences, and I think he had been published about 100 times. I only note this in order to express what tremendous impact I think that had upon all of us younger architects. After accepting the chair at Yale, his projects became larger and more influential. The Art and Architecture Building at Yale in 1958, Boston Government Center in 63, <coughs> numerous housing projects, both high-rise and low-rise, and mega proposals for New York and Miami churches, libraries, schools, universities, a parking structure for New Haven, and uh, just a, a, a wide, wide range of, of buildings, including corporate buildings. The magnitude of his work is difficult for most of us to comprehend these days. And in the next year, 10-year ten, ten period, Paul had been published 200 more times. There was no doubt in anyone's mind that Paul Rudolph was to become the next master architect. And when I traveled in 1964 with my family around the US for about seven years looking at architecture and visiting various places in the United States, we looked at Wright's work, Mises' work, the work of Kahn, Saarinen, and Paul Rudolph's work. I can still recall the tremendous experience of entering and exploring the newly completed Arts and Architecture Building the quality of the space, the sequences of space, the quality of the light and texture, and the powerful structure were awe-inspiring. The Boston Government Center and the parking structure in New Haven were amazing to experience as well, and we also made a trip to his high school in Sarasota. Paul Rudolph in those years was a phenomenally important architect. He received six doctorates, honorary doctorates, uh, but the same press that published him practically every month from 47 to 67, I think, has ignored him for the past 20 years. Rudolph has continued to work, and I'm sure he knows who he is without the press. He has designed Bond Center in Hong Kong, Colonnade Condominiums in Singapore, and the Dharmala Sakti Building in Jakarta. He continues to build with his consistency and his passion. In one of the most recently published articles on arts, architecture, and society, Rudolph stated, architecture schools sometimes seem overwhelmed by passing fads in, architect in the architectural press, for the principle of the matter is not made very clear. Principle is the only way. The entire architectural experience must always be subjected to principle when contemplating any work of architecture. Tonight, I hope Paul Rudolph will share with us the principles that he deems important in the making of his architecture. Paul Rudolph. 
Thank you very much. The last few words which you have just heard is what sums up my lecture uh, tonight, so maybe I don't even have to uh, tell you what I was going to say. I have chosen to make a title for my lecture, which I think has not been announced. It's called The DNA of Architecture. And by that, I really mean the great principles of architecture. You see, I sense that there is great creativity in your school, and therefore this audience. But because you are young and uh, have a long way to go, it concerns me what happens to your innate spirit and talent. And therefore, it is my intent to try to be helpful to you in this matter. You see, you cannot teach people to be creative. Uh, you can help to make environments which encourage creativity, but it all too often uh, it gets lost. So I won't talk about creativity at all. I will talk about the essences, the DNA of architecture. They are considerations of site, of space, of scale, of structure, of function, and of spirit. There are six in number and you can make your own list of principles, if you will, uh, and that would vary with each person in this room. But I do believe that in order to make the maximum use of your innate talent, that an understanding of those principles of architecture, which make architecture architecture, it is unlike the other arts, although there are many times it is very similar, and it is certainly not the considerations of the engineer or the administrator or the, often the specialist or the numerous people that you will come in contact uh, uh, with uh, uh, to help carry out your buildings. It is those essences which start with the beginning of time, I believe, and continue to this good day. I will use as illustrations uh, examples from the history of architecture, from 20th well, from everywhere. Uh, uh, including some works of my own, to make, allow you to make sure that I follow my own principles. I had established by about 1952 or three uh, these principles for my own use with a great deal of help from a great many people, I should say, because I had an excellent architectural education but uh, the idea of an overriding, guiding um, uh, set of ideas is uh, anathema to many people, and it may be to you, uh, 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 so be it. The first slide, please. Yes. <clears throat> I will start with sight. Of course, the greatest... Oh, good. <clears throat> By sight, I mean urbanism, 
and everything that goes with it. It means taking into account what has happened before and what is yet to come, uh, as well as the present. The greatest uh, uh, urbanism often happened in Italy, for reasons which I haven't any idea, uh, and the greatest of all of these took a thousand years to get itself built, i.e. the Piazza San Marco. Why is it great? And why is it meaningful for us today? It's because it is not a series of isolated buildings. It plays little attention to style, per se, but it uh, makes a greater whole out of a series of parts, which is, of course, one of the definitions of all art. It, uh, there is little or no compromise with regard to the stylistic niceties of the buildings involved. Uh, however, they are all physically joined, and that's the real point of, about that. Uh, that it's only when buildings are physically joined so that there's no leakage, except where you want there to be leakages, that uh, uh, urbanism uh, uh, finally becomes uh, uh, more comprehensible. Each building plays a part from a hierarchical viewpoint, i.e. the Doge's palace is clearly a special uh, uh, place as opposed to the uh, long sidewalls enclosing the piazza which are uh, very open at the bottom and are sh for shops and for uh, merrymaking, uh, whereas the upper portions now are used for offices uh, but at one time were used uh, as places to live, and of course the, the, the cathedral placed as a focal point. It, the Campanile was the last thing to be built. You might have thought it would be the first. It took three major enlargements before it got to this uh, uh, stage. I suppose one hopes that it does not take a, a, a yet another stage, but time goes on, and so you cannot really be uh, sure. I see that, well, I want to make it go backwards. Isn't this the rear one? Yeah, good. I'm going to place them in the opposite direction because they're confusing. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Still don't have the right one here. The hierarchy of building types enters into urbanism, of course, and uh, you will find on the right-hand side one of the uh, clear examples wherein the cathedral is given the most space in front of it, it has the greatest plasticity, it has the greatest amount of decoration, if you will, it, uh, its silhouette is uh, uh, magnificent, its viewing angles are absolutely clear. It's a very important building, uh, of course, and you don't have to be told that because it manifests itself. And that in relationship to what goes on around it, which is, of course, housing and, and now offices, and the spaces are much smaller and the, uh, the buildings are much more uniform. There's very little silhouette, in, in, in fact. It's the dialogue between the buildings which is so uh, successful. And, but we have little notion about hierarchy of building types. But it's quite simple, it seems to me. Those buildings which are for everyone should be at the top of uh, uh, the hierarchy of building types. And those uh, buildings which uh, are not lesser in their use, but, uh, 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 but are, of course, immediately in, important because they're usually places of work and places to live, they are lower down because they're for individuals, uh, 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 as, at least traditionally that has uh, been the way it has been. Now, you can say we have no hierarchy of building types, and that is by and large true. 
That is partially because of a 20th century phenomena that housing and uh, uh, office buildings, uh, places of work, are much, much larger than, shall we say, the church, which has, of course, no, more, no money uh, I- I anymore, or even good time establishments, which are relatively small. You, you would take a cathedral in the middle of, uh, of New York City, which is very large it, it, uh, insofar as buildings go, but it is surrounded by even larger buildings, and therefore the idea of a hierarchy of building types by size, anyway, has been completely turned upside uh, uh, down. There are certain phenomena of the 20th century which we tend to ignore. One of the phenomena is that uh, the idea of form, of a city having any kind of form whatsoever, is anathema, apparently. And everything starts out uh, looking like a World's Fair uh, development. But whether you like it or not, there are certain underlying forces which have great possibilities. You'll see an aerial view of Fort Worth, Texas, which uh, is a kind of pyramid. It's a natural, taken in the overall, it's a natural pyramid because of the value of the land. And psychologically, uh, it, 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 that is quite a natural thing because people want to be at the center of things, uh, by and large, and so it's natural that people build in much more dense, uh, in much more compact uh, ways at the very center. Uh, I would like to think that this very mundane idea will eventually give uh, 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 American cities somewhat more um, uh, uh, meaning. The hierarchy of building types and the continuity of, of buildings is shown in uh, something which I know is the Southeastern Massachusetts University, which with many other people, uh, and incidentally I will not try to list all the people that I've worked with because that would take the whole uh, 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 time that I have with you. Uh, it, needless to say, for 30 more years, 35 years, I've worked on this campus with many, many people. I was been fired three times, and uh, 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 but uh, was somehow reinstated because of the other architects who were working on, uh, 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 not because of the uh, governor of the state of Massachusetts, who said, "Get rid of Rudolph because his buildings look so expensive," and when told uh, that that uh, uh, they were no more expensive than other buildings that the state was uh, building, he said. It doesn't matter, they still look like they're more expensive, which is a big compliment, I thought. <coughs> in any event, this is a new campus, and in a sense, much easier than adding to the existing thing. It's a mile in diameter uh, road, it's a commuter campus, and there's a ring of parking, and then a ring of uh, space uh, for additional buildings, and then uh, uh, two rows of undulating buildings which form a kind of center, which make a turn at uh, what you would call a campanile, but which is, uh, for the state of Massachusetts, is called an information tower. And uh, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, it forms a pivoting point, and you know where that came from. Uh, it is also a effort to situate buildings on a series of uh, terraces which step down to, from a high point of entry to a, uh, not shown in the photograph, uh, a, a, a lake. There are others who have uh, made satellite developments around uh, 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 this project, but I'm happy to say that uh, with one exception, few people have been willing to touch the center and I feel very good about that because uh, uh, I, I, I uh, think that the center, that it got this far, it shouldn't be monkeyed with too much uh, by too many other people. Now that's a very egotistical thing to say, but um, in spite of one's best efforts, nothing is ever really good enough, of course. And uh, it, it, uh, uh, it, it, uh, 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 so you need all the help that you can get. Now the idea of siting has of course to do with uh, where it is. On the left hand side you will find 
uh, a building in Florida, an early building, a uh, high school, which I would like to think shows clearly that it is in, in Florida. On the right-hand side, you will find uh, one of the most magnificent structures uh, known to man uh, because it combines many uses, i.e., uh, well, vehicular traffic and uh, shops and above that, uh, residential areas, the Ponte Vecchio in, in Florence. It is the coming together of many things in terms of siting and therefore urbanism, which is of a, a tremendous interest and uh, we don't really uh, know how to do that. Um, <coughs> the idea that the vehicle uh, is somehow alien to architecture and we want to uh, get rid of the car, or at least some people want to get rid of the car, it doesn't appear that that's going to happen anytime soon. And so I happen to love cars anyway, so it doesn't, doesn't uh, matter to me. It's just that we don't know how to handle them. Uh, you in California know better than most, uh, uh, as long as you're going at a fast rate. It's when you, when the car comes near the precinct of the building and the transition of getting out of the car and getting into the building that we don't have very good ideas about how to handle that. Uh, on the left-hand side, you will see the entry to the Acropolis. Uh, one thinks that class, great classical architecture was highly organized, which it is, of course, in many ways, but it was also very free. And one sees that when it came time for the chariot to pierce the building, uh, they didn't think twice about making that day larger to accommodate the width of the chariot, but the columns remain much more narrow for pedestrians. It's this accommodation of two entirely separate kinds of uh, activity, both very much related to man, which uh, we have not really got the hang of. So um, if you want to really be a classicist, uh, and are interested in automobiles at the same time. You don't have to be embarrassed by that. You can look at one of the greatest uh, work, classical works of all time, i.e. Uh, the Acropolis. Well, the notion that the car will form the real dominance of the 21st century, of course you have that in uh, LA. Uh, it's that once you get beyond that, uh, that, that uh, the intermediate, uh, the um, getting from the great throughways to where you really want to go, that it becomes like everybody uh, else. But the idea that the car will be the generator, the car and its geometry and its idea of going up and down and its fluidity and the, the geometry, which is the total opposite of the gridiron, uh, uh, pattern will undoubtedly uh, find other ways uh, to, to organize uh, our, our, our cities. On the left hand side you will find a diagram, it's only a diagram, of, of what might happen to Kennedy Airport. You know Kennedy Airport is a zoo of the greatest dimensions and uh, architectural zoo and um, uh, so it's a suggestion that over the existing buildings, or in front of them, to hide them as much as possible anyway, you park, make a great parking uh, garage, and you take uh, everything that's in between this existing buildings and plant grass or whatever, uh, but it should be quite vacant and, and, and no buildings. And you would then begin to have a scale which is commensurate with, a, uh, with, with the uh, importance of one of the major gateways uh, to the United States. On the right-hand side, you will find a suggestion about um, something which is known as the Lower Manhattan Expressway, which it, it has never been built and never will be built, and perhaps that's right, I don't know. It, it is a suggestion, though, of, yes, uh, building below ground uh, uh, a, a throughway, but then building on top of it uh, a network of buildings which are related to what is already uh, there so that the pedestrian flow uh, on, on above ground is uh, not really interrupted by the um, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, needs of the uh, uh, traffic below. Now, in New York, there's, of course, at the East River, you will find the form of the, uh, that is necessitated, something of the forms that are necessitated by the automobile are actually taking place by the use of air rights. You see, we tend to want to separate uh, uh, movement of uh, vehicular movement from our buildings. I think they should be brought much closer together. Now, there are any number of reasons why that's difficult, uh, noise and smells and so forth and so on. But it, and this is an important but, when the land values become, uh, reach a certain height, a degree of uh, importance, then the use of air rights becomes really important. And therefore, the forces, other forces tend to uh, want to use the land above uh, a, a, a throughway. And so very ordinary buildings are, are, are being put up all along the, above the East River Drive. The only unifying force, really, is uh, uh, the uh, FDR Drive. The FDR Drive is an architectural experience of the first order. I shouldn't say of the first order. The essences are there. It is um, not regarded as a work of architecture. As a matter of fact, no architect ever thought about it. Uh, it just happened, and uh, with the help of a lot of engineers. But it goes in plan, uh, follows the coastline, which means it goes in and out. It opens up uh, uh, and becomes much lighter and much darker on the uh, inverse uh, curves. Its entries are nothing, but that would be easy to fix up. It uh, goes up and down according to the natural uh, terrain, and uh, it could be uh, a, a really great work of, of architecture. Um, I don't know why we have such difficulties with the cars, because by, by and large, uh, all Americans except art historians and critics uh, uh, love American, lo lo love cars. But uh, 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 I, I find that the car is a generator of architectural form, which we don't uh, uh, understand very well. But in terms of citing, it, it, it will become uh, truly important. Architectural space. Why is it that buildings have vastly different characters? And when they are good, it's an appropriate character, not one which has been superimposed on it by uh, somebody's notion of how the building should be. It has to do with architectural space. As a matter of fact, a definition, a definition of architecture is that it is used space. And please underline used space. But that space has been modified psychologically to accommodate uh, man's feelings. Architectural space is the closest thing that uh, architects uh, have in their palette, so to speak, to accommodating the human spirit. It is those characteristics which makes a religious building a religious building, or a governmental building appropriate for its use, or a school, uh, so forth, and um, uh, residential uh, uh, and office space. What are the characteristics of architectural space? Architects like to talk about architectural space, but it's never very clear. I may not be any more clear about it, but uh, uh, it is something which finally uh, separates architects one from the other. And it is through the understanding and the, of the appropriateness of certain forms certain dimensions, certain color, certain uh, lighting, uh, and the way you get into it and the way you get out of uh, the, the building, et cetera, which uh, makes it, uh, in terms of what it is used for, psychologically satisfying. Of course, religious architecture comes to mind. At first, you have the Pantheon, which is lit, as you know, by one single light source, and it is circular in plan, uh, 
with a rectilinear portico to enter uh, it. And that light, anyone who has stayed in that building for any time and see the sun as it moves through the building, you immediately, at least in the 20th century, know that you uh, uh, are part of a universe. Of course, the Romans thought of it as a world in and of itself. Uh, I suppose one of the definitions of, of a building which uh, remains useful or, or meaningful is one that each generation sees new ways of looking at it and is rewarded. A Gothic cathedral uh, does very much the same thing, but in entirely different ways. You can say that the space moves, that it has axes and counter axes, that it moves in a circular fashion as it does in the Pantheon. But in a Gothic cathedral, of course, it moves horizontally and vertically and diagonally. But the important point is that these movements are balanced one with the other. In 20th century architecture, you will find much architecture which is not really balanced uh, uh, from an interior viewpoint. What I'm saying is also true of the exterior. But from an interior viewpoint, uh, if the forces and counter forces of movement of space are not balanced, uh, then a, a sense of non-equilibrium uh, comes into play. Now you can say that, of course, these are old-fashioned ideas and that uh, we don't want everything to be balanced and uh, equal, uh, equilibrium, uh, questions of equilibrium. Well, that's one way to look at it, and I, I don't want to say that these things uh, are always, uh, uh, there are always other ways of looking at things. That's where the question of creativity comes in, as opposed to the idea of principle. Space moves. How does it move? At what velocity? And what does it focus on? Those are, uh, are, are really my points about this. Now, in the Renaissance, of course, people started literally, architects started literally with a point in space. And in plan and in section, it generated outward uh, from that, often being uh, carried to extremes uh, and uh, uh, where in the sun was absolutely ignored uh, and you have symmetrical facades on all uh, sides. But this created some of the world's uh, uh, finest architecture. It created fine architecture partially because the Renaissance had very clear and very simple rules which people agreed about. Now, how that came about, uh, people write books about that, and I, you know, I don't know. Uh, all I know is that there was a certain, um, the results gave a certain clarity to how they thought about things and uh, gave um, a unity and strength to the whole of the Renaissance. Our architecture is the exact opposite, I might add, and it's one reason why, for me anyway, postmodernism is the silliest thing I ever heard of. But uh, I, that's uh, uh, one of my many biases. I try to stay away from my many biases, but sometimes they just come out. Anyway. Uh, uh, <laughs> One of the rules that the Renaissance developed is that uh, an exterior space, and you have to understand that exterior space uh, shrinks everything. Uh, everything seems about half the size that it, it, it is if it were built as a totally enclosed space. That's a phenomenon which I can't explain. I just accept it as a fact and, and proceed. But in any event, the Renaissance people thought that a horizontal distance of of one to one was really a vertical, was just about perfect. Our uh, one and a half to uh, uh, horizontal to one was just about as far as you could go horizontally before you, you lost the sense of enclosure uh, for space. And if you got to two or two and a half to one, well, you were out to lunch. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't work. Now, of course, um, uh, Michelangelo was a little bit lucky with his Campidoglio because, in terms of the architectural spatial aspects because the site was canted uh, it, naturally and that uh, allowed then the fourth wall to be uh, eliminated because it gave a certain indication of where that fourth wall uh, would have been if it hadn't been the entrance to the city and uh, of course a fantastic uh, 
uh, view. Of course, uh, Michelangelo uh, uh, placed uh, the greatest known uh, sculpture uh, from ancient times in the middle of it, and uh, to this good day, it, it sings as a few other uh, uh, plazas do. It has to do with the proportioning, uh, well, uh, uh, a great many uh, uh, things. The idea that architectural space changes um, with its use, our intended use, is most clear probably in the 20th century in Wright's work. You will find on the right-hand side, and I'm sorry the photograph doesn't convey at all uh, what it should. You cannot photograph architectural space. I should have said that uh, earlier. As a matter of fact, you can't really photograph architecture because of the implied movement uh, uh, involved. Uh, movies are maybe a little bit different, but, uh, well, doesn't seem to work very well either there. You can only experience architecture. It certainly cannot be uh, a photograph. Um, in the Wright's uh, house, you will remember that the way you got to the center, uh, which always had uh, in his residential work, a huge, massive um, fireplaces and great sense of enclosure and great sense of protection, a great sense of uh, the roofing, the way you were uh, protected. But the way you got to it and out of it, you also remember. The, 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 uh, one of the great uh, things about architectural space is its progression from one thing to another. Uh, and uh, uh, in all of Wright's uh, uh, greatest work, that is, is totally clear. Of course, the space within a space is best illustrated, perhaps, by a, a four-poster bed, the, the whole idea of intimacy as opposed to a much larger uh, 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 space. Now, Wright knew all about the thrusting and counter-thrusting of space, both inside and outside. And uh, if one draws a diagram, which I happen to have done, of falling waters, you will see why it is probably the greatest 20th century house in America. It is totally balanced. Uh, if you uh, reduce uh, all the terraces to a single line of, uh, with its direction, and then opposed to that uh, the opposite direction, and opposed vertically to that the the stacking of bedrooms are, are um, uh, the, 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 the fireplace, uh, and the whole uh, way the entry side uh, is handled in a very, very different way, you will see that this is a very conscious effort on his part to balance the, the, the whole. Now there's the question of whether or not the, the space itself is balanced are the solids, solids which define that space are balanced. Uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, on the inside of this house, uh, it's a bit disappointing because, at least for me, because uh, there are other houses of right which manipulated the thrusting and counter-thrusting of the space itself, not the uh, solids which make up that uh, uh, space, which are much more eloquent and also in terms of I its light. But um, th that's... Uh, a Picayune uh, observation. I juxtapose that on purpose to, of course, one of the great buildings of all times, uh, St. Peter's, which also depends on the hollowness of the space, and in this case, uh, uh, reaching a, a, a climax at the crossing of the axes and the Baldacchino and the circular move, combining the circular movement up to the dome and uh, uh, the light coming in at, at right angles uh, to that. The direction of light and the direction of the space are often uh, opposed to each other because after all, uh, uh, light essentially comes diagonally in, in, into uh, 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 buildings, but space often escapes uh, diagonally or vertically or horizontally uh, through buildings. And so the tension between the thrusting of the space and the uh, way the light comes in often uh, uh, creates a dialogue which um, uh, uh, has to be uh, recognized. Wright's buildings are uh, beyond analysis, really, uh, because they, they uh, uh, are so magical 
And yet, and yet, he often follows uh, very simple uh, rules, if you uh, will, and accommodates them in many uh, different and varying uh, ways. It's one reason why I wanted to, 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 to speak of principles, because uh, Wright undoubtedly was the most creative all, of all American architects, uh, but he had his own rules. Uh, uh, he didn't, he wanted to talk about how buildings came about and its relationship to society in general and democracy and so forth, and that is fine and wonderful. Uh, but he didn't clue you in too well about what he really was thinking, I believe. Anyhow, uh, all of us have our secrets, uh, uh, and he had his. On the left-hand side, you'll find in the Renaissance the idea of sequence of space that they retained uh, when you had many spaces, and I'm leading up to a cellular use of space, uh, that it was placed in a kind of void, and each uh, uh, room or space was very complete and symmetrical within itself, but you went through a kind of anonymous uh, void. On the right-hand side, you will find a building in North Carolina, which is something like this. It uh, doesn't show, unfortunately, the whole sequence of space from parking past a, uh, uh, a pool of water, a uh, reflecting pool, an entry and into what amounts to the uh, lobby of this space, which is uh, five stories high, but an effort made to uh, connect that lobby with the office space uh, 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 above. And so that the uh, whole sequence of uh, diagonal movement in plan uh, to be greeted with diagonal uh, movement of space vertically and uh, how that is understood both uh, above and, and, and below is what that, that is about. Now, in terms of the uh, urbanistic use of space, it remains a puzzle to me why our country has so few urban spaces worthy of consideration. That is not true, really, of Europe, uh, traditionally. I'm, I'm talking about traditionally. Um, and uh, it is something about uh, their sensibility, or maybe it's because uh, they've been around so much longer and have many examples to behold, but there's a natural uh, feeling or understanding by city fathers, and perhaps that's the real point, uh, as well as architects, of the importance of, in terms of our cities, comprehensive, and I underline comprehensive, uh, uh, spaces. And that doesn't mean just because you draw something on the, uh, two-dimensionally on the page that it really is a, a three-dimensional, alive, breathing uh, 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 space. You will find, of course, that uh, uh, St. Peter's uh, uh, is an understandable and maybe some people would say too dogmatic uh, uh, use of, uh, 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 of, of space. After all, they tore down many medieval, fine medieval buildings to, to uh, create that, but they got something very much in return, uh, uh, fortunately. In Washington, you find, of course, the exact opposite, that, uh, okay, the notion of a uh, entry plaza, and you would put the two uh, opposite each other, but it's sliced through by the automobile. And of course, a sliced through a plaza it makes no sense whatsoever. They should have taken a page from Rome, where in the entrances or small uh, piazzas are often placed diagonally, not ne never across uh, the street from each other, but diagonally, and it would be much better off. We, when we have a bit of outside space, Seldom do we know how to handle it or what to do with it. Uh, um, the best example of that, or one very good example, uh, is, I'm sorry to talk about New York, but I happen to live there and so I know it a little bit, um, uh, that at the southeastern corner of Central Park, uh, the, the Plaza Hotel is set back uh, 200 feet, I guess, uh, from Fifth Avenue, which is the, the eastern boundary of uh, the park. And there is a small 
open space, and that acted as an introduction to the hugeness of uh, Central Park. But then a building was placed opposite uh, this, which has a sunken plaza, which is never a very good idea, uh, but there it is. And so the Plaza Hotel has a plaza in front of it, and now it has another plaza in front of it. And the whole thing, of course, uh, uh, makes no sense uh, uh, whatsoever. My point is, we don't know what to do when we do have a bit of uh, uh, outside space. Outside space is uh, something like this. It involves many other things besides the, uh, space. You will find on the left-hand side uh, a uncompleted, uh, now about to be completed by others, uh, something called the Boston Service Center. Uh, it, it is two-thirds completed. It has never made any sense because the low buildings uh, were, were not uh, uh, sufficient to in, inform the, 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 the space. Uh, it is it deals with scale, and I'm jumping ahead of myself, in that the scale of the exterior perimeter is very large in scale because it is for automobiles, the streets, but the scale of the, uh, of the plaza uh, was stepped back in order to catch the fleeting light of, of Boston uh, and to proclaim it as a pedestrian uh, space. On the right-hand side, you will find a suggestion to make more of a valley in uh, a beautiful piece of land, uh, not uh, in fact built outside of Washington, uh, wherein the higher buildings, uh, and this is another 20th century phenomena, where the relationship of high buildings to low buildings, we, we don't really, uh, uh, we plop one next to the other and that's the beginning and end of it. Uh, uh, I, I don't believe that's the way it should be done at all. I, I think there should be a, a, a modulation between the high and the low, or a stepping of the buildings, or in this particular case, a placing at the crest of the hills, the automobiles and parking, and above that, the highest buildings, and then they uh, uh, graduate down to uh, lower and lower buildings, and finally, uh, single family uh, uh, housing. I call this a kind of hill valley. Uh, uh, urbanistic approach to, to, to architecture. Um, now, the, the notion that what can you do with high-rise buildings? They are often, for technical reasons, essentially a, a, a shaft into spa space because of the structural uh, problems and the uh, efficiencies involved and so forth. But, uh, and that isn't going to go away. But uh, uh, are we then doomed to have only freestanding, high-rise buildings closer and closer together, and that's it? Uh, and no real understanding or no comprehensible exterior space? I don't know. It's a problem which uh, uh, has plagued me for a great number of years. In Jakarta, I have proposed a series of high-rise buildings on the left-hand side which are joined together not by bridges. They look like bridges, but they're not. They are extensions at certain floors of the office space. And because in plan then, uh, it, you, you can uh, arrange these buildings so that they form a kind of perforated wall, if you will. The idea, the essential idea back of that is to form, to find a way of forming comprehensible exterior space with high-rise uh, uh, buildings. If with high-rise buildings there's not a release of space, then you feel that you're at the bottom of a, of a well, and of course that is not uh, at all uh, 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 what you want. The whole notion of relating um, cubicular space, which is uh, probably 80% of all the buildings built in, in the whole world, as far as that goes, uh, I mean by that uh, all residential work, schools, hospitals, uh, 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 all of those things which are really uh, can finally be uh, thought of in the most simple terms as, uh, 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 as cubicular in nature as opposed to flexible open space. Uh, it, it, the, the model on the right is a, an attempt to combine these two uh, so that the, uh, you don't have all of the residential uh, work at one f point and all of the uh, 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 office buildings at, at another point. Now, the 
the idea of the, I spoke of this just a little bit, but I want to continue a, a bit more. This is a chapel which I made at Tuskegee a long time ago now. And uh, it is essentially a fortress because the earlier chapel was burned uh, and uh, under very unfortunate uh, circumstances. And so all it was felt by the client that uh, one should, it is a place of refuge, uh, uh, to be uh, quite blunt uh, uh, about it. A skylight was placed at the perimeter. The buildings are uh, in plan are canted uh, for acoustical reasons, and so is the, the ceilings, the hyperbolic parabola, and it's a great kind of canopy. And the light comes in, as mentioned, of course, diagonally, and plays over the uh, continuing surfaces of the walls. The space, however, escapes, and that is what the uh, diagram, not very successful, on the left-hand side tries to suggest about this. The, because the floor is essentially level, uh, and the ceiling is undulating, one can say if the space escapes diagonally through the skylight, and that's essentially what it does, um, then uh, uh, if, you are, if the ceiling structure, or the skylights in this case, are um, quite high, then the space is going at a very, space is moving at a very rapid pace. But when it becomes low, at the low point of the hyperbolic parabola, then it's moving much more uh, uh, slowly. It's no news that space moves at varying rates, and this is an attempt to uh, capitalize on that. And what I've just described, uh, while it's difficult to draw it, uh, if you were to visit this chapel, you would, you, you would feel that uh, uh, very much in, in, in indeed. Now, these are two cottages which were built a long, long time ago before uh, most of you were born. All of you were born, probably. Well, uh, 1948 and 1952. Uh, uh, and the first one is the one on the right. And it shows that one of the principles, i.e. structure, uh, can get ahead of you, can get the best of you. Uh, it's a, a, a steel and tension roof. And, uh, of course, inside, uh, psychologically, you think the roof is about to collapse. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. It was a kind of structural exhibitionalism, which uh, uh, I uh, think uh, I find deplorable now. I didn't at the time. But then, three years later, I was able to uh, build a cottage. These are all guest cottages, because people at that time would not let me make the main house. They wouldn't trust me uh, with, with the main house. It's okay, I, I've never complained uh, about my commissions at all. Uh, I only thank, feel I've been very lucky uh, uh, about it. That's just a fact, that's all. Um, well, the interrelationship of the six principles which I've uh, uh, enunciated, uh, they vary according to need and according to the project. In the first cottage that I show you, the idea of a kind of purity of structure or a, um, uh, a minimal use of structure. After all, these steel and tension members were uh, three-eighths of an inch by one inch, by, uh, and I think it was 12 inches on center, and that was it. Uh, 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 well, some insulation and, and, and roofing. Uh, but I thought of it as the most efficient use of steel, and therefore justifiable nonsense. The space is the more important thing, especially in uh, a building of this uh, uh, nature. On the left-hand side, you see, I learned that lesson, I would like to think, and uh, structurally, it's, well, it's made out of two bodies, that's all, and nothing wrong with two bodies, I found. But the space inside uh, can be transfer, transformed from a wide open pavilion because two uh, solid panels are hinged horizontally at the top and are uh, lifted uh, uh, up by counterweights, which you may or may not be able to see, but lifted up on outriggers. So that it goes spatially from a completely wide open pavilion to a very snug uh, cottage, which is uh, uh, lit by the third uh, glass panel each time when the, the panels are down. The panels, of course, the children love to ride up and down on the counterweights. They're about eight inches and 
in diameter, and that was a bit of a fault with the whole thing. But uh, you know, every, I find uh, everything has its faults, uh, 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 and they get used to it. And besides, the children have grown now long since, and but others have come. In any event, uh, the the panels uh, were the infilling wall. They, they were overhang. They were the hurricane panel, and of course they were the security panel because it's uh, 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 a, a ventilating panel uh, uh, too. Uh, so it, the owner thought of it in terms of a series of efficiencies. That's fine. You say one thing. It's not that you're dishonest. It's that uh, what the owner wants to see is here is he's really getting his money's worth. Uh, but my private thoughts, I've been absolutely open and direct, of course, with you. There's no, 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 no reason for me not to be. I'm going to have to go much faster because um, we're never, I would never uh, uh, finish. So much with regard to architectural space. Well, not so much for architectural space. It's uh, all this time. Scale. Scale and our lack of understanding is one of the many reasons why we cannot participate uh, in a forceful way uh, in urbanism. There are new kinds of scales, partially because of the automobile and partially because there are many more of us. And uh, uh, the art of city planning is very much based on the art of understanding scale. Scale is like a zoom lens, if you will. If you want to make that which is far away seem nearer, you can handle that architecturally by uh, the use of scale or if you want to make it seem uh, uh, closer at hand or, or, or farther away. Scale is related to uh, the idea of moving through space and that you understand a given object in varying ways. People talk about a building being in scale or out of scale, sheer nonsense. Buildings need multiple scales in order to, uh, every building, uh, it depends on which side you uh, uh, understand it from, which has the entry side, what's on either side of it, uh, et, 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 et cetera. Scale, of course, is a question of relating human beings to the building. That uh, has many manifestations. Uh, it's part of what the human being can do. For instance, all of us view the whole world uh, around the horizontal axes uh, uh, and making a tunnel from our eyes at 22 and a half degrees on, on, on either side. And that is the way one really determines uh, what comes into focus as you walk through, up to, into, out of uh, 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 in, in any building. The, um, we understand the, uh, and can recognize people at about 120 feet. At 120 feet, uh, unless they're a hunchback or some a great uh, problem like that, uh, you, you, you don't quite know who they are uh, uh, unless you're very familiar with them. Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, that 120 feet allows you to gauge then uh, the, the plasticity, if you will, uh, or at least the small dimension uh, uh, elements of a building. It is... Uh, 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 scale is different from uh, 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 from large and small, it, from d uh, sheer dimensions. Scale is, you can have, um, well, uh, the classical example is the 19th century cameo, which had great sense of scale, even though it was tiny, because of its, Im its imagery, it was so clear. Of course, the painters understand uh, scale much better, probably, than the architects, although the architectural question of scale is very different uh, than, than what the painters, in fact, uh, 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 look at. It is um, scale next to space is perhaps, well, I find it totally fascinating uh, it has to do with uh, the light and what is implied, and um, it has to do with uh, uh, photography, um, uh, including uh, movies, and the whole notion of uh, a one-inch square photograph. Are you looking at the uh, diagram of the veins in your hand? Are you looking at a mile square space? Uh, uh, you often uh, 
I don't know. In any event, the notions of scale have always informed uh, uh, architecture. Uh, the idea of the entry uh, was always especially, well, I shouldn't say especially in Gothic architecture, but an example on the left, it was broken down and that was the integral use of sculpture. Uh, it was not, sculpture at that time was not thought of as something being in a museum or uh, mosaics or painting. Uh, it was, it, it, uh, uh, they thought about how it can become a, 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 not an applique, but a, a had a role to play in, in, in the building. That leads one to uh, considerations of scale and so forth. On the right-hand side, of course, you will find the Milan uh, Galleria, which is 100 feet high and marvelous because it not only uh, is a shopping area and a place for people to gather, but it's also leading to a great uh, plaza. Uh, uh, you will find on the left-hand side, uh, Le Corbusier, who understood scale perhaps better than any uh, 20th century architect, he made his high court building seem from a distance like a one-story high building by its uh, sunroof, but in fact is four stories high plus a sunroof. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you will find something of Sixth Avenue, which is totally scale-less. Now, I think one can argue that scale-lessness uh, has its meaning in terms of very large buildings, especially when closely spaced as in Sixth Avenue. But what is less forgivable is the idea of how they're treated for the first 120 feet, which as a pedestrian, one understands in very, very different uh, uh, ways. Now, uh, of course, traditional architects understood those problems uh, uh, very well. You'll find Palladio uh, uh, making, uh, using his uh, columns and then other sets of columns and uh, architectural elements, but they were all to, uh, as I see it anyway, a question of reducing, reducing, reducing the scale. On the left-hand side, you'll find the entrance, to, one of the entrances to Trafalgar Square. It's a very ugly building, really, I think, and has little architectural merit, but I show it because it reads so well uh, uh, all the way down to Buckingham Palace. Uh, it, it, it is uh, supporting only, well, a couple of floors, these uh, small columns, but the, the dimensions of the opening of the gateway itself uh, in, in, in the building reads from a, a, a huge uh, distance and is very much responsible uh, for the development of that. The single floor is a scale-giving element. You will find uh, that at Fatipu Sikri, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the celebration of the single uh, floor, or on the right-hand side, something of the, of the Boston Service Center, which I spoke of uh, 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 earlier. Um, now, the scale of the building on the left is also a part of the Boston Service Center, and sh it shows that the columns are very large and that the service corps are very inefficiently placed at the corner and uh, uh, as opposed to the single floor, floors on the inside. On the right-hand side, you will find something in the Bond Center, uh, which is uh, about 44 stories high. Uh, the towers are, uh, it's something like this. Uh, from a great distance, they read as one mass. Uh, from close up, you understand that there are two buildings, and then you begin to understand that they're divided into four uh, uh, parts, not equal, horizontal parts, and then those parts are in turn divided in so that there are single floors which are placed to accentuate the, the other divisions. The single floor, uh, I believe in the 21st century, uh, uh, will come in much more into its own as a humanizing and scale-giving uh, 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 device. Um, the, well, I'm sorry, I'll uh, sequence a little bit. Structure. Stone has been the way man has built permanent buildings, and it's, of course, it is, has a, been used fantastically well, starting with the pyramids, uh, and one got the most out of uh, the stone, of course, in compression. The step from that to um, a Greek temple was a fantastic one. And then the step from that to uh, uh, 
the uses of stone in the 20th century, wherein panels have been used made uh, of stone. There's nothing wrong with that, but then the stoniness of these uh, panels hung, literally hung, onto uh, multi-story buildings has robbed the stone of its natural um, structural component. Well, stone, uh, of course, weathers beautifully and is often beautiful uh, in itself, and so why shouldn't it be used? And one can argue that its, uh, uh, its longevity is much greater, etc. But the use of stone, from a structural viewpoint anyway, has been modified uh, by uh, techniques which uh, bother one. Uh, I guess it's difficult for me to see really uh, how the equivalent of the vernacular building on the right hand side, which is in North Africa, and the stoniness of it, the real character uh, of that building, can, it, it, it grieves me to, to think that that same material is hung on buildings which by their very nature uh, uh, and size and method of construction are uh, uh, totally uh, 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 different. Stone, of course, in the hands of great artists, uh, as Michelangelo was made to seem light, and uh, uh, there you have the forerunner of postmodernism, I guess, in the United States. On the left-hand side, you will find that the stone has made a whole town, uh, and indeed for centuries. Uh, that's the way the single material has been used. We are not blessed with having many uh, materials in the 20th century. We have too many materials. And uh, it's difficult to say or see how uh, in the 20th century a single material can be used to, to, to bring about a kind of peace in, 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 in our cities. Um, this is a short uh, uh, history of, of the uh, skeleton in, uh, of multi-story building, of course, it started out being very heavy. It got to be lighter in, in Sullivan's uh, hands and in Mies van der Rohe's hands. It uh, uh, became very light. And in Le Corbusier's, it, it was using steel. And in Le Corbusier's hands, it became, well, something else quite different. Uh, 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 as a matter of fact, one feels the poured quality of the concrete. <laughs> of the concrete. <laughs> the, uh, difficulty uh, is that these buildings are, on the surface of it, easy to copy, but in fact are next to impossible to copy. And that is uh, part of the, the difficulty today, that uh, uh, it all looks so easy, but in someone else's hands, you cannot really make a Mies van der Rohe uh, building at, at, at all. Uh, there's a parking garage on the right-hand side, which is an attempt to say a parking garage can be something other than a unfinished uh, concrete or steel uh, uh, frame, which just didn't get its walls, and therefore would be called a uh, office building, or a steel intention um, uh, uh, stadium uh, for the government of Saudi Arabia, uh, unfortunately not built, or um, concrete block exposed in in uh, Florida, uh, wherein the glass was let into the concrete block uh, and into the precast concrete uh, uh, lentils so that you read in elevation the, the sequence of space on the inside, or on the left-hand side, bent plywood uh, with two by four uh, construction. Each one of these comes very much from uh, the nature of, of the material. Now, of course, right. Uh, you can never, ever forget Wright in discussing any aspect of architecture. He understood instinctively how to juxtapose uh, materials. The, the, the columns the, uh, seem to really grow out of the, the desert and are much uh, too big than they're needed. And the wood is much thinner than it, uh, anybody ever made it, although it does get thicker a, a bit. Uh, uh, below. He understood the, the weightiness of materials and how to get the very most out of them. Labrousse, on the, on the left-hand side, I, uh, 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 one of the incredible 19th century buildings. Uh, I don't know how his columns really hold up the roof, but there it is. And so uh, 
uh, one has to uh, uh, believe that. The notion of getting the most out of the materials uh, has, of course, uh, traditionally been one of the things that has, has made architecture. I would like to submit the following thesis to you. This is a notion which, well, for a long time, I've been, uh, um, well, very much interested in. I have next to nothing to show for it, but I remain interested. And I might add at this point that it seems to me that uh, architects should work on two levels. That which you can build tomorrow morning, and by all means work on it and get it built. Uh, but that which should be built, or at least you think it should be built, uh, but somehow for various reasons cannot be built. And to uh, think about those things and project them and uh, see how they can be modified and uh, so forth. In any event, uh, the, the, what I've termed the 20th century brick, which of course is nothing more than, less than a trailer. And one is fascinated because it has the structure and the mechanical systems, uh, et cetera. And eventually I'd always thought that this would come into its own and still, in fact, do. These are projections on the right-hand side uh, of what, how to get away from the FHA infernal eight-foot-high ceilings. Uh, uh, you know, one uh, really admires Le Corbusier for refusing in Germany to build, uh, uh, I think it was seven feet four. Uh, uh, it, he wanted to build seven feet four, and they were not uh, allow him to do it, so he walked away from, from the job. One really admires uh, 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 that. You will find, incidentally, that the laws, as they uh, apply to what you do, become ever more strict, and it becomes more and more difficult uh, to avoid lawsuits and uh, so forth. But uh, you, you, chose, you didn't choose the time you live, but you, you, you have to make the, the most of it. On the left-hand side of this uh, uh, unbuilt model on the right uh, is uh, uh, some housing in Singapore, which is built in the usual way, i.e. poured in place uh, concrete and uh, finishes all applied on the job, including a mechanical uh, system. But it's really a study, from my viewpoint, of the architectural possibilities of the, uh, the, the uh, 20th century brick. Um, on the left-hand side, you will find some tilted uh, 20th century uh, brick. And here is a rich man's uh, summer cottage, uh, also uh, built with tilting uh, walls to be built, which has been built with a, a pivoting roof and pivoting floor and pivoting uh, 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 walls. And, um, then, from a structural viewpoint, uh, you, you see the clear articulation of the Barcelona Pavilion. But, and I admire this building more than any of Mises' uh, uh, buildings. But the fact of the matter is that the, the, the columns, which are, of course, stainless steel and therefore reflect what's around them, don't really read in actuality as they do in plan. Those of you who have seen the rebuilt uh, Barcelona Pavilion know that. And that, that is a, a phenomenon, that the plan can uh, really, uh, well, it's not just the plan, architectural ideas can be very misleading in, in, in actuality. It doesn't matter that they don't read in the Barcelona Pavilion. As a matter of fact, the original uh, notion of the Barcelona Pavilion was to use the walls structurally. And why it, it was done, uh, changed, I, 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 I don't know. The idea of structure as the dominating element of, of architecture is, uh, well, it's in certain cases true, depending on the building type, but in other cases it, it isn't. But certainly the mechanical system, uh, just in terms of your budget, if nothing else, uh, plays a fantastic part in, in, in this. Uh, my campus, which I so showed you at the beginning of my remarks, uh, this is part of the library, and the columns are about eight feet uh, out to out, but they're hollow. Uh, there, in fact, are four columns at the four corners, and they're uh, uh, joined by a concrete block. The whole campus is built out of a special concrete block, I forgot to say. And the mechanical system runs in this hollow column uh, vertically. And then at the top, which you may or may not be able to see, there are two uh, girders or beams 
uh, which run horizontally, making a three-dimensional network through the whole of this uh, uh, campus. You see, the hung ceiling is really the enemy, finally, of architecture. Uh, I use it all the time, uh, uh, but I never want to. And uh, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it really is a very unfortunate uh, thing. The idea of the, the clarity of the parts coming about from the structure is most clear on, on the right-hand side of Le Corbusier's uh, great monastery. Uh, and uh, the, the, the idea that the regular spaced columns need not uh, uh, make the most monotonous uh, building in the world uh, uh, come into uh, play. Now, for, in terms of function, the, this will sound very strange. I'm all for buildings working. People sometimes say that isn't true of me uh, a, 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 at all. Well, they say a lot of things, so that's okay. Uh, uh, it's a question of what does work and what doesn't uh, 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 work. Here, the building was sold, and you have to sell buildings to clients, if you, no question, by, the idea, by making some computations uh, or having computations made showing how much it would cost to air condition this building in Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, with the shading of glass and without are with uh, much smaller windows. Of course, the smaller windows uh, were the most efficient of all. Well, we got around that one by various ways, and it showed that by using huge overhangs uh, to shade the glass, uh, one could uh, justify uh, these overhangs in terms of the air conditioning cost, the original cost, and the operating cost. But that is that function? Well, you can say it's function, but that is not the real reason why these uh, uh, over, overhangs there. Uh, I felt that should be a building of Indo in Indonesia. I had been taken on a drive from Jakarta to a place called Bandung, which is about a four hour drive over marvelous mountains and hills, which is almost a continuous village, uh, sometimes only one cottage deep. But I saw there the most beautiful roofs I've ever seen anywhere in my life. You know, the vernacular architects beat us often. Uh, pay attention to what vernacular architects do because they do it much, much better uh, often than professional architects. You could just feel and see how the cool air was brought in uh, under the cottages because quite often they were raised and uh, let out at various, the, the hot air was let out at various places as you arrived. I wanted the building to partake of that aspect uh, uh, and so that is the real reason why. Is that uh, functionalism? Well, it's a kind of functionalism. I, I, I don't know. The same can be said of this, uh, that um, the function of the uh, tower, uh, which is an office tower, is separate from the function of a small hotel on the lower right-hand side or the commercial areas. And each one of these functions, uh, it seemed to me, should be expressed in different ways. Um, but still having it read as a, a total. The, the building, uh, you, on the left-hand side, you will find the, uh, something of the hotel, which proclaims the cellular nature uh, of the building, as opposed to the uh, more continuous, or the continuous office space. The office space is, of course, arranged so that it suggests a pagoda. Uh, people have pointed out to me there are no pagodas in Singapore, but there are pagodas nearby, and, and so that's okay. Uh, 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 but the real reason for this is that I thought there should be a way to walk on the building, not just around its bottom or it, 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 its top. And so every four stories, it is set inward. Of course, this is at the equator, and uh, the tilting of the glass, uh, uh, essentially, it comes from, from uh, that aspect. Um, uh, sorry. Spirit. When it comes to architectural spirit, of course, it perhaps has as much to do with uh, the handling of natural light uh, from an architectural viewpoint, which, uh, of course, uh, uh, Wright uh, uh, knew instinctively. If you have ever stood in that office building and watched the sun uh, as it pierces the interior, uh, 
Of course, you can't do that because it's now uh, artificially lit. Uh, that is one of the, the most dynamic and spirited uh, places ever built. Uh, something of the Tus Tuskegee Chapel is on the left-hand side. Um, spirit comes from many different places. It comes from decoration, strange as it may sound. Uh, this is a bedroom in New York uh, apartment house, which has been um, uh, encroached on by adding storage and storage. And finally, mirrors were placed at each end wall, uh, but then few people really want to look at themselves. In front of that was a, a, a glass curtain made. And so the, the, the imagery is reflected back and forth to infinity. So what amounts to a oh, 12 by 18 foot room, uh, you have a bit of infinity in it. I put that under uh, the idea of, of, uh, of uh, 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 spirit. Our, hmm. Our, you have in LA a highly spirited uh, uh, architectural phenomena, Watts Towers, which is, uh, comes only from the human spirit. Uh, as I say, uh, I sometimes think architects want to have spirit and often have spirit, but it's not maybe as freely, it doesn't as freely come through as when the, the uh, non-architect uh, 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 participates. Uh, the, th th this is often true of decorations, or for celebrations, that when the architect uh, tries to make uh, uh, appropriate uh, implementation of uh, uh, celebrations, then it doesn't really work. It also is certainly true with the graphics uh, 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 field. We really often depend uh, on, on uh, others. In conclusion, I want to say that both of these projects ooze with uh, uh, spirit. On the right, you will find the American Indian and what he thought about town planning and how eloquent and wonderful uh, that, that must be. And on the, uh, I'm sorry, on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side, you'll find Machu Picchu, which is undoubtedly the greatest uh, 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 development of urbanism in this hemisphere. It is uh, too little known. It's difficult to get to, but, uh, it is magical. It's done by people who were not tutored in, in architecture, and, but it's a direct growth of how they felt, in other words, their spirit. And on this note, I would like to read uh, a, a short paragraph, uh, which is a definition of urbanism, because you understand that everything I said tonight, it may be very small, or large or whatever, but it all is a part of urbanism. We, uh, the 20th century will always be known, I think, as a time when we contributed almost nothing to, uh, to urbanism in spite of great efforts. Urban design is remodeling, adding, subtracting, reworking, relating and reforming three-dimensional space for human activities, including all pedestrian and vehicular systems. Urban design deals with the old and the new, the expanded and the contracted, the humdrum and the extraordinary. It brings people together, it separates people. It commemorates its history. It never lies, but portrays life three-dimensionally as it really is. At its best, it creates related and usable exterior spaces, provides means of getting there and are there once you are there. It is the mother art of civilization, for it allows and deeds and demands ideas, thinking, reactions to opportunities of the moment executed in the spirit of its time, but demands respect for earlier efforts. The new depends on the old and is responsible for the future. If the old is ignored, misunderstood, the future will mock the seemingly new and reveal for all too plainly 
to see the false thinking expressed. All of the other arts are handmaidens to urban design. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Are there any questions that we have in the audience tonight? Or everything was so clear, there's nothing to ask. All right. Good night. <laughs>